Hello, I'm William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and uh, in this video, we're going to take a look at another video on uh, classical education. I've been trying to uh, devote some time uh, before the fall term begins to provide some help for homeschool parents or private school parents, even private school teachers, uh, to sort through uh, the confusion that exists because of uh, what I call the fake classical education movement, which has uh, attempted to uh, take advantage of the dissatisfaction that parents have with modern schools and present something in its place, um, uh, but to falsely advertise it as a restoration of, of the education of, um, of the past, of wise men and saints. And, and that... That false advertising has misled uh, many families and has created all kinds of confusion because as we in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy work to actually restore the real classical Catholic education that was employed through uh, church history, we have to deal with questions about all of these ideas and things that parents have heard and seen and books that they see floating around and... and um, and to try and, and clean up some of this confusion, I, I pointed out for parents a handful of um, red flags to watch out for uh, that, that can be used to identify this uh, fake classical education movement. The first one was that the names grammar, logic, and rhetoric are used to refer to stages of learning, um, which are really just names used instead of elementary, middle, and high school. It's just a bunch of nonsense that, that's, that's commonly uh, spoken about in, in this fake classical education movement. That idea came from a lady named Dorothy Sayers, who lived in the 1900s, has nothing to do with classical education. So watch out for, talk about the three stages of learning, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. That's, that's just baloney. Um, I, I warned about um, people who promote the study of the so-called great books. Um, this is usually just a, a launching pad for book sales and catalog sales, boxes and boxes of books to purchase for homeschooling when you know parents don't need to spend any money on necessary books for classical education. In the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, we provide online texts for every work that needs to be studied because they're all available in the public domain. After all, these are all ancient texts that have been studied for centuries and centuries. It's all available for free. Many of the works you can get, you can get from a local library. Um, uh, this is real classical education. There's no need for new books. And so uh, I warn parents about the promotion of the great books, not as a sincere interest in the actual books that were studied in schools in the past, but as a means of selling boxes and boxes of books uh, for homeschool families to purchase. So watch out for the great books. I talked about the diminishing role of a teacher in this fake classical education movement because they don't have expert teachers. Even the, 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 the leaders and, and speakers and publishers of this fake classical education movement, they don't know the subjects. Um, and so they diminish the importance of teaching to justify why they have uh, unskilled people teaching, uh, offering support and advice to parents, uh, leading children in classrooms and so on. They, they sort of mock the idea that a teacher should be an expert who stands at the front of the class and teaches the arts and sciences to the children because they can't do that. Um, and, they, and they try to replace that uh, true classical method of instruction by a master teachers. They try to replace that with what they call the Socratic method, which is just a fancy name for class discussion. And so it's just a, a, another way that they, they present this fake classical education, trying to make things seem um, historical or philosophical when in fact it's just the same kind of, of uh, problems we have in modern schools given fancy new names. So watch out for 
use of the term Socratic method, class discussion, and things like that. I, I, I talked about watching out for um, catchphrases, just these marketing uh, slogans and, and gimmicks that they use, like the phrase truth, goodness, and beauty, um, things like that. Just, just keep an eye out for these shallow phrases that have been taken out of context from history and, and inserted into, into this classical education movement just, just to have something to talk about. You'll see them always resorting to these catchphrases like formulas in ancient poetry, um, an easy red flag. Uh, I also warned about um, seeing generalizations and vague explanations of these studies because, the, again, the people talking really don't know these subjects. And so uh, they, they like to talk about things on the surface level but then anytime they, they go deeper than that, it gets very, very sketchy, shallow, confusing, vague, everything is generalized, and so on. And you can, you can see where their lack of expertise is exposed anytime they, they go off script a little bit and start to talk about the subjects because they don't know the content of these subjects. So, Keeping an eye out for those red flags, we've gone through a couple of these videos and the feedback has been good. I know that they've been helpful to a number of families. So we're going to take a look at another one. This video here is uh, What Are the Seven Liberal Arts by Dr. Christopher Perrin. We looked at another one of his videos on uh, what is classical education. So we'll look at this one and see uh, what he's got to say about the seven liberal arts, whether this information is accurate, um, whether there's anything in it that's, that's inaccurate that needs to be clarified and corrected so, so you don't have to deal with any confusion if you've watched this video and walked away thinking things that um, turn out not to be true. Remember, in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, our whole focus is the teaching uh, the seven classical liberal arts from the original sources that they were taught from throughout history. So... Um, I'll help you through this video and, and clarify anything uh, that, that, that really isn't, um, isn't accurate. So we'll watch this video together, see how things go, and, uh, and, and comment uh, wherever I think a comment would be helpful. So let's watch What Are the Seven Liberal Arts by Dr. Christopher Perrin of uh, Classical Academic Press, one of these classical uh, education publishers. Let's take a look. The liberal arts. We've heard of the liberal arts. But many of us, despite perhaps being told that we have studied the liberal arts, cannot name them. So what are the liberal arts? Are they English, philosophy, and English? Are they philosophy, philosophy, and philosophy? Are they English, philosophy, and history? No. No, those are not the liberal arts. Traditionally, there were seven liberal arts. And All right, let's stop here. Um, what, he, what he does here is, is helpful. Um, it's important for us to understand the, um, the trouble and the confusion that's caused in modern education because schools often pull phrases and terms from history and continue to use them, but they change their meaning. And so liberal arts is an example of this. He's about to explain rightly that in history there were seven liberal arts. There were seven arts that were considered essential for an education um, that would lead to the pursuit of philosophy or wisdom. There were seven liberal arts and, and the meaning of those, the meaning of liberal arts historically is not the same as the meaning of liberal arts in modern educational circles. That's why he was joking a bit, um, again, rightly, that uh, we, can, we can hear about a, a liberal arts college or, or a liberal arts degree, things like that in modern education. But when you ask, what, what are liberal arts? Like, what is this study? What is this liberal arts college? What do you actually study? You'll, you'll just get all kinds of nonsense answers. And, and he was he was poking fun at that, which is true. Is it philosophy, philosophy, and philosophy? You know, what exactly is 
uh, a liberal arts education. So this is an example of what happens when terms are taken from history and used in modern circles with different definitions. So he's identifying the problem, but what's interesting is that this is the same thing that the fake classical education movement has done. The, the, the problem he's describing eloquently is the problem with this fake classical education movement. Um, so when we talk about grammar, logic, and rhetoric as stages of learning, that's the same exact problem as pulling the term liberal arts and using it to describe modern subjects. Um, so it's good that he shows an understanding of this concept, because it's a common concept. But what's, what's puzzling is how these folks don't realize that they're doing the same exact thing. Okay, so um, it's good to see that, um, not just because I want to say that everything he said about the liberal arts in modern circles is right, this is true, but also to see that there's no self-awareness that they're doing this same thing by pulling terms from the past and using them to talk about modern studies. And we're going to see examples of where he does this because I have seen this video before. So let's keep watching here. And here they are. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric, the first three of the liberal arts. These three together were called the trivium. The trivium in Latin means the threefold way, the threefold path. And these arts represented the threefold path along the way to the mastery of your tongue. Your okay, now this is where we start to see what I mentioned as one of the red flags. Um, it's easy to talk about the seven liberal arts. It's easy to know the names of the seven liberal arts. And, and we'll see this all the time. We'll see folks in this um, classical education movement name the seven liberal arts as if that's some, some kind of uh, demonstration of their understanding of classical education. But what I talk about when I say their expertise is their lack of expertise is exposed when they move beyond that shallow talk. As you watch him move now to talk about these arts, what you'll see is there's, there's not knowledge of the classical liberal arts themselves, but he'll begin talking about things that are just true in modern education. So uh, we'll see that, that grammar, logic, and rhetoric, he doesn't describe them as they actually are in the real sources of classical studies. For example, the grammar that he describes is not the grammar that we'll find in Alvarez's Latin grammar or in Priskian's Latin grammar or in Jacob Gretzer's Greek grammar. The grammar that he describes is a grammar that's going to be found in a modern English grammar course. Uh, when he talks about logic and rhetoric, same thing. We're going to see that the logic he describes is, is not accurate with regard to Aristotle's actual teaching in the Organon, which is the source text, the master text on logic. But it gets vague and, and sloppy, and, and you'll begin to see that. As soon as we move to the second level, where expertise would begin to, to be visible, we start to see that it's not there. So keep an eye as, as we go through that. I'll back up a little bit here. These arts represented the threefold path along the way to the mastery of your tongue, your lingua, the mastery of language. They were the verbal arts or the language arts. Grammar is derived from a Greek word, gramma, which simply means letter. It's learning your letters. It's learning how to read and interpret texts and language. To now, just to pause there, grammar does not go so far as to lead us to interpretation. When we get into literature and the interpretation of literature, there is a part of interpretation which has to do with grammar, just understanding the possible meanings of the language. But in, to get into interpretation, you know, that, that's going to get too far. 
And again, a lot of this, what we see is when they talk about the seven liberal arts, they talk about how the seven liberal arts basically prepare a student to study the great books. So keep an eye out for that as we go along. Clarity and to write with clarity to be able to understand accurately any text that uh, comes your way is to be just a master grammar and to speak and write accurately yourself. It's to learn how language is structured and works across all human languages. The parts of speech come to mind, of which they are eight. See, here's a perfect example. Um, he mentioned that grammar, the study of the, the, study of the art of grammar, um, applies to all languages, and, and that's true as far as universal grammar is concerned. It applies to language in general. That's why the Jesuits, for example, as missionaries, were, were able to go to any, any civilization, any society, and they could pitch camp and quickly learn the local language, establish a local grammar so that they could understand and communicate, and then translate Christian books into those languages which they had just learned. Their knowledge of classical grammar allowed them to be great missionaries because of what he said. But then the next thing he says is, is false. He says, for example, the parts of speech of which there are eight. Um, now, that's true in Latin, but that's not true in Greek, and that's not true in English. So this is one of those spots where... Um, after talking about how grammar applies to different languages, he then, you know, reveals his actual lack of study of grammar in different languages because it's not true that there are eight parts of speech. There are eight parts of speech in Latin, but there are not eight parts of speech in Greek or English. And so this is the kind of thing, once you get past the surface, and I know I'll get, I'll, people will say I'm just picking on it. No, it's, it's a person who knows the art of grammar would not say, you know, generally there are eight parts of speech. That's not true. Anyone who studied Greek knows that that's not true. Anyone who studied English grammar knows that there are not eight parts of speech in English grammar. So these are the kind of things, once you get past this superficial talk about the seven liberal arts, when you get into the actual content, things start to get very, very sketchy and uncomfortable because they really don't know the seven classical liberal arts. And which I will not enumerate for you right. at this moment, but right. a noun and a verb and an adjective would be three of them. And then there is logic, which is another art of... Just to be obnoxious and picky, it's worth noting that in Latin grammar... Um, noun and adjective actually aren't two separate parts of speech. There are two kinds of, of, of nouns. So you have noun, substantive, and noun, adjective. So my point is not to, be, not to be obnoxious, again, but just to say that there really isn't an expert knowledge of these arts. They, they haven't been studied. The classical liberal arts are not known by these folks, um, and it's revealed when they talk about them that differs from grammar, it is the art of correct reasoning and by implication, incorrect reasoning. What does it mean for human beings to make an argument, say, using a syllogism that means with logic, and a syllogism involves uh, two premises that lead to a conclusion, and if it's properly constructed, lead inevitably to a conclusion. That's logic, the art of correct reasoning. It's the study of one's own mind. Rhetoric is another art, another verbal art, and it's the art of persuasive speaking and writing. Aristotle defined it as observing all the available means of persuasion. Now notice there, this is, this is the kind of thing I want you to see. What he just does there is he quotes Aristotle and provides a definition of rhetoric from Aristotle, which is right on the money. Because that's what an expert does when he talks about a subject that he knows. So Dr. Perrin here is familiar with Aristotle's definition of rhetoric, which is great. And he, he gives that definition because that's what an expert would do when he talks about a topic that he's actually studied. 
Notice how different that talk is from the way he talked about grammar and logic. When he talked about grammar and logic, he didn't have that accuracy. He didn't quote a source. He didn't reveal um, any sort of source-based knowledge of those subjects. But when he got into rhetoric, he did, because there is knowledge of rhetoric. I would, I would assume that he has studied Aristotle's rhetoric and knows exactly what Aristotle's definition of rhetoric is, because he, he nailed it on that one. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. When, we're, when we have expertise in a certain subject area, and we have studied the seven classical liberal arts, we talk about them with the simplicity and the accuracy that he just spoke about rhetoric. That's what should be present in his discussion of the seven liberal arts, if he had studied them. He gives away the shallowness of his familiarity with grammar and logic when he speaks clearly about rhetoric, naming a source, accurately referring to that source, and, and speaking helpfully and intelligently on one of the liberal arts. So that's, that's an example where that's what expert talk would sound like. Let's just back up a little bit and hear that again. It's the art of persuasive speaking and writing. Aristotle defined it as observing all the available means of how persuasion. How that is. That's, because we can win an argument and still lose the person. So what does it mean to say, instruct and move and delight one's hearers? Cicero would say those three things are the essence of rhetoric. Notice again, notice a very clear quote from a master source. That's what expertise sounds and feels like for a hearer. He wants to define rhetoric, he goes to Aristotle, because Aristotle wrote the, the art of rhetoric. He wants to talk further about rhetoric, he's got a quote from Cicero, the Roman master of rhetoric. That's what expertise looks like. He didn't talk that way about grammar. He didn't talk that way about logic. And you, you can see the difference between expertise and sort of vague generalizing once we go beyond the first level of, of naming the art. So, so there you see what expert talk about a subject would look like. I just posted a video today, what is dialectic? Go watch that video where I explain what dialectic is. That's, that's what experienced teaching looks and sounds like. It doesn't require preparation. You can't say, oh, well, this is just a five-minute video. Maybe he didn't prepare. I didn't prepare for that talk on dialectic today. I sat, turned the recorder on, and made a 50-something minute video where I explained the history of logic and what dialectic is and why people are confused about it. It doesn't take preparation if you actually are experienced in the studies. He gives us an, a, an example of what it looks like when an expert talks about a topic, when he talks about rhetoric. It's very simple and clear. You can see how much more comfortable he is, and you can see how uncomfortable he was talking about grammar, you know, kind of fumbling through the eight parts of speech, and then, you know, going beyond that and saying that that applies to other languages and there's discomfort there there's no expertise but in rhetoric quote from aristotle quote from cicero there's expertise that's what it should feel like when an expert talks about a topic so i hope that's helpful we need to be able to instruct delight our hearers please them and move them that's the study of rhetoric these are the three liberal arts of language and of course, if there were seven, the artes. Now, one thing I want, to, I want to have you look out for, almost no one knows anything about the four mathematical arts. Um, you'll find people like to talk about grammar, logic, and rhetoric, um, and, and they can somehow kind of find them in modern schools and modern studies. But as soon as we get beyond that, where you really can't fake it anymore, because, you know, I mean, grammar, we have English grammar classes in public schools. We have logic classes, um, rhetoric, we have public speaking and things like that and debate classes and stuff. So you can kind of finagle your way through grammar, logic, and rhetoric. But when you get to the four mathematical arts, 
There's no more modern faking it. And so in this fake classical education movement, one of the clearest signs, I should have named this as one of the red flags, but there is just a cluelessness about the four mathematical arts. And we're going to see that as he you know, mis, mis, um, identifies these four mathematical arts, um, doesn't get their uh, definitions right as to what they are. And, and you'll, see, you'll see the shallowness. Again, compare it to how he talked about rhetoric when he talks about these mathematical arts, because no one in this fake classical education movement, because they're, they're all working within the modern school program, even though they claim to be different, they still stick in a modern school. They, they teach modern mathematics, and they don't even... They don't even touch classical mathematics because it doesn't fit into their mission. And you'll see that as he talks about the four mathematical arts. And you'll see that in anyone who teaches uh, from this fake classical education movement. And again, you can go watch my videos on the quadrivium. Um, we, teach the four math we teach the four classical liberal arts of, of, of the quadrivium in the academy. You can go study the texts, it's, it's all there, but when, when the fake classical education movement talks about the quadrivium, the four mathematical arts, it's just really cluelessness. So let's take a watch. Septum liberales, there need to be four more. And indeed, there is the quadrivium. And the quadrivium contains the four mathematical arts that have to do with the mastery of number. And they were arithmetic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Only humans do calculations. Only humans use words and speech. Now, some may argue that some animals do speak, but the humans qualitatively are in a different order when it comes to the use of language. And only human beings do math. <laughs> and mathematics involve arithmetic, which is discrete number, learning how to count and add and subtract. and. Okay, right there. You see how we go from talking about the four mathematical arts of the classical quadrivium. But when it's time to talk about them, he just ends up talking about modern modern school mathematics, modern arithmetic. You see that? That's not what classical arithmetic is at all. So let's just listen to that again. Involved arithmetic, which is discrete number, learning how to count and add and subtract and multiply and divide. That's got nothing to do with classical arithmetic. That's modern school arithmetic. That's, that's, that's Ray's arithmetic. The courses that we offer in the academy, and we call them modern arithmetic. That's where you learn to count and add and subtract and multiply and divide. That's got nothing to do with classical arithmetic. Go over to the Classical Liberal Arts Academy website, open up the classical arithmetic course, and look at the text. There's no addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division lessons in that course. That's not what it's about. So this is what I mean when I say once you get past the you know, talking about the, lib the language arts, um, naming the liberal arts. The first three, they tend to be somewhat familiar with because those are, those are simpler to understand. But once we get into this part of it, the quadrivium, it's just clueless. Okay, so arithmetic in the classical quadrivium has nothing to do with adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Just no knowledge of classical arithmetic. Geometry, which is, involves discrete shapes, how shapes are formed, and what the mathematical relationships between numbers and figures are when it comes to shapes. Again, that's, that's really not what classical geometry is about. He says geometry is about discrete shapes, and that, that's not what geometry is. The word discrete means separated. That's what it means. So arithmetic, we can, we can refer to arithmetic as discrete quantity. Um, actually, that's not even a good explanation. It would be discrete multitude because in, in mathematics, um, 
In the classical curriculum, there are two types of quantities. The quadrivium is a four-fold investigation of quantity. There are two kinds of quantity, multitudes and magnitudes. Arithmetic and music are studies of multitude. Geometry and astronomy are studies of magnitude. Arithmetic is the study of absolute multitude. We can say discrete multitude because the, the objects of a multitude are separate. That's what discrete means. That's what absolute means. That's the study of classical arithmetic. So when he said discrete, I think he said discrete number, um, that's, that's okay for classical arithmetic, but his explanation of the four operations, that has nothing to do with classical arithmetic. When he goes on to geometry and he says discrete shapes, that, that's not classical geometry. There is modern geometry class, obviously. You know, I went to public high school. You likely did as well. You studied geometry in high school. That's not classical geometry. Classical geometry is the study of magnitudes, or, or uh, we could say bodies, the study of magnitudes, and it's the study of magnitudes at rest. That's why it's called geo or geometry. It's the measurement of the earth, because the earth in classical philosophy is assumed to be at rest. So geometry is the measure or study of objects at rest, uh, magnitudes at rest. And we seek to investigate what can be known of objects, or I should say magnitudes at rest, by means of investigation, starting with the elements that are given in Euclid's elements, that's why it's called the elements, starting with self-evident truths that we can be absolutely sure of, and reasoning from them to draw conclusions about um, magnitudes at rest and build a knowledge of magnitudes at rest. That's what geometry is. So again, there's clearly not an understanding of, uh, of the, the classical mathematical arts, and we're going to see this, um, the same, this same vague sort of wandering talk about astronomy and music up next, and I'll, I'll clarify that when we get there. And astronomy involves the study of, of shapes that are in motion. Think about the, the planets that move, and it becomes the precursor to our modern day physics, which studies shapes in motion. And music involves the study of numbers in motion, because music does involve vibrating sound waves and all kinds of interesting harmonic ratios, mathematically considered, that are proportionate and very interesting to the, to a, the mathematical mind, as well as pleasing to our ears. See, that's... That's really not what music is. Let me explain. To go back, there are two kinds of quantities studied in the quadrivium. There are multitudes and magnitudes. Absolute multitude is studied in arithmetic. We study number by itself. So any whole number, for example, one, two, three, four, those are, those are absolute multitudes. Music is relative multitude. So the study of music isn't about... I think he said number in motion. Um, that's, that's not the idea of mo Music is the study of relative multitudes. So, for example, he mentioned talking about um, music being, we're talking about theoretical music. We're not talking about any actual performance of music or anything like that. We're talking about the theory, the th theory of music as, as it is a mathematical art. And so when we think, about, um, we think about sounds that are made, and we're talking about classical music, so illustrations that are given would be the lengths of strings. Um, we're talking about string music. We're talking about the lengths of pipes and holes in pipes like a flute, and how the different lengths affect the different pitches and things like that. How the different lengths of strings, think about a guitar, when you, when you hold the fret and shorten the string, it changes the sound trying to understand the mathematics of that. It's relative multitude because it's all about ratios. It's all about these different relationships between different numbers. So even the idea of a fraction would be, 
would be considered a relative multitude. The, the, the quantity half is a relative multitude, whereas seven is an absolute multitude. The, the quantity double or triple would be a relative multitude. That's the subject of the, the, the art of classical music. Um, and that's, that's how it actually relates to the practice of music. Because once we get into music, and again, talking about ancient music, where they're largely working with stringed instruments and, um, and wind instruments like pipes and flutes and things like that, not, not modern instruments. Um, when we consider the study of the, re the, the, the different lengths of, of pipes and of strings and how harmonies are formed by different ratios or different, different um, intervals and combinations of those different mathematical uh, quantities, which when, you know, for example, sounded at the same time, create an effect that has to do with the ratio that exists between them. The study of that whole relationship of relative multitudes is what is studied in music. In astronomy, astronomy is simply taking geometry, which is the study of magnitudes at rest, and then looking up to the heavens, because again, in classical astronomy, it's assumed that the heavens are in motion. Um, so, so again, if, if, if you're going to take modern physics, modern physics, which he mentioned with regard to astronomy, doesn't even agree with the philosophy of classical astronomy. So that, that's not what astronomy is talking about. Astronomy is the study of magnitude in motion magnitude in motion, as opposed to the study of magnitude at rest in geometry. And you can see how this relates to uh, classical philosophy, the understanding of, of how the world actually moves and exists in classical, not modern, philosophy. So once we get to the modern era, and you've got Galileo saying the earth is in motion, and you've got all of this, um, you know, modern cosmology, it's called, uh, this this disappears, and that's why this is not in modern schools. So when you get to the classical quadrivium, the issue is, do you actually believe in a modern heliocentric worldview where it's, it's stated as a matter of fact that the, the earth is in motion, that the, the, the sun is not in motion, and again, the heliocentric theory changes um, it's allowed to change without getting called false, whereas the, the geocentric theory is not allowed to change. But there's classical philosophy that's no longer even accepted in modern classrooms, and I would argue is probably not taught in any of these uh, fake classical schools because they just run with the modern maths and sciences. They don't even consider classical astronomy. They don't even consider the classical mathematical arts, because they just do the modern stuff. And so it's going to be very difficult for someone who's talking about, you know, addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, modern arithmetic, which is just pragmatic. It's not philosophical. And talking about modern physics, which is based on, you know, the, 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 the works of, of, of Bacon and Newton and the modern scientists, to try and make any sense out of the four classical mathematical arts because they don't have anything to do with modern arithmetic, modern calculus, modern physics, and so on. Uh, that's modern education. And that modern education comes from modern philosophy. And that's why you can't do these two things together because it's two different systems of thought. Many Christians believe that the old classical astronomy, the old Aristotelian worldview, has been proven false by modern science. They believe that. They've been taught that in modern schools. They've been taught that Galileo proved this and this and this, and therefore the whole Aristotelian uh, natural philosophy is just to be abandoned and ignored from now on. They've been taught that. They believe that. They think that that's actually true. And yet, if you go and read, I always recommend for Christians to read a book written by um, Albert Einstein called The Evolution of Physics. In this book, the, 
you know, the evolution of physics, he explains that what modern schools teach is false. That this whole idea of, of, a, of a sun-centered system and an earth-centered system, they're merely matters of reference points. And they are both, they're both true if we consider them as two different ways of looking at the universe. But modern schools don't teach that. Modern schools teach that Galileo and the scientists in the 15 and 1600s proved the Catholic Church wrong, they proved Aristotle wrong, and that's why in our modern schools we don't teach that stuff anymore. We just teach materialistic, modern, you know, Baconian, Newtonian physics and, and science. And that's modern education. That's the problem. That's the problem. To get into the classical mathematical arts, you have to first understand and appreciate the Aristotelian worldview, which was never objected to by St. Thomas Aquinas or any of the saints or doctors of the church through the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s. Cardinal Bellarmine, who, you know, Saint Robert Bellarmine, who was the one who opposed Newton, remember, didn't believe that, uh, who opposed Galileo, sorry, remember, didn't believe that Galileo had proof of what he was saying, and that's why he gave him a hard time, because there was no proof that what Galileo was proposing was actually factual, but was merely a theory. And yet today, when kids are sent to schools, and this is true in Christian homeschools, not just secular modern schools, they are taught the modern worldview, modern astronomy, and so on, as if it is established, proven fact, and the way that the saints and wise men through history thought about the universe is, is positively false. That's part of the problem of modern education, and it's why these folks can't understand the classical quadrivium, because the classical quadrivium relates to the classical natural philosophy. So that's why we'll find this kind of wandering, um, disinterested talk about the classical liberal arts that pertain to math. Um, we'll simply refer how they, like he said, astronomy was the precursor to modern physics. No, no, not at all. Classical astronomy was not a precursor to modern Newtonian physics. That's not true. The Baconian method, the, the philosophy, and I'm sorry if I get deep here, but the philosophy of modern science is not a development of classical natural philosophy. That's not what it is. It's a rejection of classical natural philosophy. It's like saying Protestantism is a development that grew out of Catholicism, or like saying Catholicism was a precursor to Protestantism. No, that's not true. Protestantism was a rebellion against Catholicism. Modern materialistic science is a rebellion against Aristotelian natural philosophy. And these are some of the controversial issues that parents have to get into and and start to learn about, because there are significant philosophical differences between the mind of a person living in the 1400s as a Catholic and the mind of a modern Catholic just immersed in this anti-Catholic, anti-scholastic, modern, materialistic worldview. It's two very different worldviews. And that's why when we look at the quadrivium, which has no place in this worldview, but belongs with this worldview, that's why this fake classical education movement can't explain what these things are, because they don't study them. They're studying algebra and trigonometry and calculus in a modern curriculum, even modern geometry. And they don't study the seven classical liberal arts. So uh, I hope that that's... Uh, that's clear. And again, if you're a parent watching this, there are serious issues that have to be discussed and studied. I, I posted a video some time ago where I talked about why I am a Roman Catholic and Aristotelian in the 21st century, and I get into some of these issues. If, if you'd like to get started thinking about 
these controversial questions, go find that video. I think the name was Why I'm an Aristotelian and Catholic in the 21st Century. It was something like that. But there are, there are big questions that we have to consider and learn about and make decisions on because this classical education, true classical education, the seven classical liberal arts belongs to the old philosophy, not the new scientific theories. So there's, there's important issues here. And that's why this fake classical movement is so weak on the, the four uh, mathematical arts. Let's finish up here. Music has been called by some the incarnation of mathematics. We know that you like math because you love music. Well, there you have it. It's a short summary. But these seven liberal arts were considered to be the arts that helped make the person, uh, that helped to qualify a human being to become the fullest version of himself. And after he had been made by these arts, he became an artist himself, liberated to serve others by creatively making things out of words and numbers. Well, that's my brief summary of the seven liberal arts. I hope it's been helpful to you. Thanks for viewing. All right, so that's a, that's a that's a clever presentation of the seven liberal arts, and you know, you can say I'm, I'm picking on things, and I am. I'm picking on things. You know, I'm picking on details that 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 you know that I'm aware of that that you know most homeschool parents would not be aware of. But the thing that concerns me is that there there are deeper questions, and and this is. One thing that I've realized as I've been doing these, um, these critique videos, one thing that I've realized is that um, th there are a number of, of bigger issues that are starting to appear for me. You know, one of them being what I just talked about, the need for Catholics especially um, to address this question of, of the ancient natural philosophy versus the modern materialistic science. That, that's a dilemma that, that Catholic parents are going to have to deal with. And I don't think many Catholic parents um, are, are willing to touch that topic. And that's, you know, when we look back and we see this Catholic culture throughout history, um, I used to always talk to my students about this. We have to realize that they don't think about the world the way modern Catholics do. Um, when they woke up in the morning and looked out the window, they understood that the earth is still and placed at the center of the universe, and that all of the heavenly bodies are moving around the earth. That's how they viewed the world. That's how they thought of the calendar. They thought of, 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 of time based on this idea of, of these heavenly bodies being set in motion by God to be, sign, to be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, as it explains in the book of Genesis. They, they weren't heliocentrists. They weren't modern Newtonian physicists. They were ancient Aristotelian or even Platonic natural philosophers. Um, so what do we think about that? You know, is that, just, is that just nonsense that we want nothing to do with? Well, that was the whole philosophy. That was the whole philosophy. St. Thomas wrote an entire commentary on Aristotle's physics. Do you think that St. Thomas, as he went through the physics, saw it all as a bunch of phony malarkey that was, uh, you know, he hoped would be proved wrong one day? No, there's no such, uh, there's no such negative criticism in St. Thomas's commentary on Aristotle's physics. It's assumed to be the truth. Uh, uh, Thomas quotes from uh, Aristotle's works in natural philosophy all the time in his writings. He didn't think that they needed to be abandoned. So we have these real problems to deal with. That, that's one of the issues that has arisen for me as I've done these critique videos, is that we've got big questions to talk about. And maybe we'll, we'll um, start to focus on some of those questions in future videos. The other thing is that as I, as I watch video after video and... and and, and see more and more of, of what's really going on in this fake classical education movement. What I, what I think it really is, what I think it really is, is simply a conservative political movement. I think it's an effort to try to develop an educational program for 
American conservative Republican people. That, that's what I think it really is. I, I don't think it has anything to do at all with um, you know, Aristotelian philosophy, scholastic philosophy, the history of Catholic education. It's really got nothing to do with that. What it really is, is um, a conservative American Republican uh, idea of what education should look like to raise good conservative American citizens. So it's sort of a, a conservative public school curriculum. That's really what it is. It might be appropriate for, let's say, a, a modern uh, government-funded charter school that took on something of a, a conservative um, culture. That, that's really what they mean by classical education. That's why they, they talk a lot about the founding fathers. They talk about Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and Benjamin Franklin um, as, as if that's what classical education means. And th that's not at all what classical education is. Classical education is Aristotelian philosophy. It's scholastic philosophy. You know, the Aristotelian tradition restored in the 1200s and officially embraced by the Catholic Church. That's what I'm talking about when we talk about classical Catholic education. We're not talking about conservative American school curriculum or conservative American homeschool programs. Uh, but that, that really is what I think many people mean by classical education. It's just an education for conservative, Republican, pro-life Americans. That's what it really is. So. Anyway, that was a that was a good video. You know, out of ten, I would say it's a seven. You know, it's a seven out of ten. It's a good video. He did a good job presenting the seven liberal arts. Um, you can see the places where he runs into some trouble. Um, you know, whiffs on the the four mathematical arts. But as I said, that's because the four mathematical arts don't fit into the modern educational system, which is really where these people still are. They're still in the modern educational system. They're, they're changing some things on the surface, but the deeper core issues, it's just modern. Um, that's why the quadrivium has no place. Nobody studies it in the fake classical education movement. So anyway, um, definitely better than the other video, probably one of the better videos we've looked at so far, but still, um, you know, they, they just can't address the seven liberal arts. They can talk about three. Um, so I, I don't know why they, they always talk about the seven liberal arts when, when they know that they really have no interest in the four arts of the quadrivium. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions or if there's anything you'd like to talk about here, uh, get in touch. God bless.